Good evening, everyone. My name is Khalil Green. I'm also known as the Gen Z Historian. It's a name I made up for myself when I finally became an influencer on social media as a way of branding the work that I do. And the reason why I like the name the Gen Z Historian is because it's a bit of an oxymoron. When people think of Gen Z, they often think of youth, of the future, of progressive movements. And when they think of history, they often think of the past, of things that are archaic, of conservatism in a way. And my job as the Gen Z historian is to perform and to bring forth the best of both worlds. And that's what I hope to do with you all today. When I was told the theme of this conference is going to be who will stand in the gap, I took that question personally. And what I'm gonna do for you all today is talk about the gaps that I see in the world and in the areas of history and social movements and how I go about standing in those gaps. But first, a bit of an origin story. So I was actually joking with Tori earlier that um, I have this theory that if something bad or something wrong is happening in America, there's probably a 99% chance that you can trace it somehow back to Yale University. And Yale University also happens to be my alma mater. So to bring it uh, to current events, as we all know right now, there was the recent AP African American Studies ban in Florida, and that ban was executed by the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, who graduated from Yale University and also got a degree in history. Once again, I graduated from Yale University with also a degree in history, so ironic enough. And also, the College Board, which is the organization that changed their AP African American Studies curriculum to take out some of the best, most critical thinkers that were included in the curriculum, thinkers like Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality, um, thinkers like Bell Hooks, uh, the head of the college board is the president, was also a Yale graduate. But these are far from the only problems that existed at Yale University. And when I was a student back in 2017, a freshman at Yale, there were no shortage of issues on campus. And I came into Yale as a computer science major. So my story with history, unfortunately, doesn't go back to my youth as it does for Tori, and I'm very envious of all of the time that she spent learning about history that I wish I had. But my story rather starts in college with the social movements that were happening on campus. So to outline a few of those social movements, I wanna first talk about the renaming of Calhoun College. So for anyone who doesn't know, Yale University is separated into 14 residential colleges, which are basically dormitory buildings. One of these dormitory buildings was named after John C. Calhoun, who was one of the fiercest advocates for slavery in the era right before the Civil War. Students rightfully had an issue with one of the buildings on campus that black students and other students would live in being named after John C. Calhoun. So there was a student movement to rename this, this building on Yale's campus. And one of the founding principles of that movement was the realities and the effects, the modern day's effects of history and the importance of being historically aware of the world around us. People had to educate each other on who John C. Calhoun was and how his harmful policies extended and almost cost America and black Americans freedom during the Civil War. Um, other notable people related to slavery that graduated from Yale include Eli Whitney. And for anyone who doesn't know, Eli Whitney was the inventor of the cotton gin. And this turbocharged uh, the economic sort of uh, benefit of slavery for slave owners and made them that much more advocates for the system of slavery. Another thing that was happening on campus was the defunding and the lack of funding for the ethnic studies program. This was a movement to get more funding for classes like uh, Latin American studies and Asian American studies um, in the face of a university system that devalued the professors and the students that were studying this. And grounded in this movement was the history of the ethnic studies movement that happened in universities in California, where coalitions of people from different racial groups, whether they would be Chicanos who were um, American-born descendants of Mexicans or Mexican immigrants, or whether it would be Asian Americans or Black Americans to the Black Panthers, these groups came together to push for ethnic studies on university campuses, and that message was shared as the foundation for this movement. Another one included the uh, protests of climate change that happened during the Harvard-Yale game, one of the most important events every year where Harvard and Yale have a football game standoff. And students stormed the field during the halftime um, performance to protest 
climate change and the effects of climate change, especially on marginalized communities. And grounded in this story was the history of the economic devastation that was brought upon marginalized communities, specifically indigenous communities when America was first colonized, and later on black American communities in the face of segregation and the devaluation and defunding of the infrastructure of cities that black people lived in. So within all of these movements, there was a clear role for history and the swaying of public opinion and the informing of people who were interested in taking part in these movements. And that goes into something that I realized, the sort of framework or the map for social change, as I like to call it. So the first thing that happens when there's a need for social change is that an injustice occurs. In the case, most recently in 2020, this could be seen as the death or the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police officers. After this, there's an important step where people raise awareness. The video goes viral, tweets go viral, people talk about it, people are finally becoming aware of what happened at a very um, logical, factual, conceptual level. After that is an important, important part that I saw play out on Yale's campus and that I saw as a gap for me to fill in with social movements happening today. And that important step is to sway public opinion. And one important way of doing that is to add historical context to whatever social movement is happening at that time. And that's what I do now. After public opinion is swayed, usually this can morph into political pressure where politicians are forced to reckon with the raised awareness and the protest movements and the logical arguments that are convincing them to make change. And the last and final step, ideally, is that justice is obtained, whether it be through the legal system or through whatever other system can repair and hold accountable those who committed an act of violence against someone else. So understanding the map of social change, as a college student, I realized that my specialty and my expertise, something that I could levy my skills toward, was once again swaying public opinion. And the first time I did this was by way of running for student body president and getting Yale to change in terms of its relationship with student activists and the administration's willingness to hear out the concerns of student activists like those who were pushing for the renaming of Calhoun College or the funding of ethnic studies or the divestment of fossil fuels from Yale's corporation. And one thing that I did to sway public opinion in regards to these movements was to write an op-ed. So the first thing that you see on the side is a Yale Daily News op-ed that I wrote called Yale Together. And I wrote this in response to the cases of police brutality that not only happened at a national stage with George Floyd, but also those which happened on Yale's campus. So four days after I was elected the first black student body president at Yale University, a Yale, policeman, a Yale police department officer shot at an unarmed black woman and her boyfriend after falsely suspecting them as perpetrators of a robbery a few blocks away. Stephanie Washington and Paul Witherspoon, as their names were, were completely innocent, and luckily, neither one of them suffered fatal in, uh, injuries. But at the same time, this shocked Yale's campus, at least the non-black people on Yale's campus, because they thought that we were protected, that racism wouldn't happen at a university as quote-unquote progressive and liberal and woke as ours. So in this op-ed, I wrote for the need for the Yale community to come together to recognize that even in Yale blue, black is still black. And this was a resonant insight for a lot of students. Shortly after this, I was able to sway public opinion by writing an op-ed about only four months later after the Trump administration sued Yale University on the grounds that our affirmative action policies were discriminatory against white and Asian students. And I rightly argued that this was a false claim, seeing as the need for affirmative action is to increase diversity on campus, which benefits all students. On top of this, I dispelled some of the myths about affirmative action in terms of it being a point or a quota system, which is factually untrue. Also, the opinion that a lot of people have that Asian Americans are hurt by it, or even white American students are hurt by affirmative action. And I called out the zero-sum mentality that was at the root of this conservative argument and why it wasn't true. Up the suit. Uh, I'm not going to say it was all because of my op-ed, but it was largely because of people who were able to sway public opinion about this issue. 
I went on later in life, and by later in life, I mean like literally a year later, a year ago, to write in the Harvard Business Review about how businesses can incorporate young, diverse Gen Zers into their corporations. And I also gave an interview to Forbes magazine talking about something that I'm really passionate about now, which is the cultural appropriation of black Americans on platforms like TikTok and the calling of black American culture, whether it be black American languages or African American vernacular English as it's commonly referred to as Gen Z slang, even though it's not. And it's a specific language system attributable to African Americans that is often co-opted and monetized by other groups. Not soon after I took this swaying public opinion through historical context and historical reasoning to other platforms like TikTok where I wouldn't have to sit there writing a thousand words worth of an article and hoping that it would get published, but instead I can in real time respond to events happening in the world and write these miniature video essays that could then circulate to millions of people. My first ever TikTok, which I released on MLK Day about two years ago, reached 1.3 million people in about 12 hours. The TikTok I'm gonna share with you today is one that talks about a really important social issue that, that is the cause for poverty in many black American communities. And that is called eminent domain. So I, wanna, I want you to hear this historical lesson um, and I'm gonna tie it to the modern day afterward. Did you know that before Central Park was known as Central Park, it was the location of Seneca Village, a neighborhood full of prosperous black Americans. At its peak in about 1855, the neighborhood had over 50 homes, three churches, a burial ground, and a school for black kids. It provided a refuge from the violent racism encountered elsewhere throughout New York City. But in 1857, the city government used a law to take ownership of the property from the citizens who lived there. This law was called eminent domain. Eminent domain allows the government to purchase and remove someone from their property so long as they say it's being used for a public good. But as one scholar says, all too often the public good is equated with enhancing property values while officials downgrade the interests of poor and African-American communities. Take, for instance, another example that happened across the country. In 1912, a black woman named Willa Bruce purchased land in Southern California, in an area that would later be known as Bruce's Beach. After her purchase, more black families moved into this area, but they also brought resentment from their white neighbors. White residents slashed the tires of black homeowners, put no trespassing signs around surrounding areas, and the KKK even set fire to a nearby home. But when all of this still didn't get the black homeowners to leave, the city government used eminent domain to seize over 24 homes. They said they needed to use it to build a public park. Today, it is estimated that the market value for the entire area would be about $75 million. In the 1940s, eminent domain was also used to take property from interned Japanese Americans, and later it was used to take property from Mexican Americans to build Dodger Stadium. As one legal professional says, it is mind boggling to think about how many opportunities are missed when the government intercedes to prevent certain people from building wealth. If you learned something new, share this video, comment on Explore Next, and follow for more. So that historical lesson can be applied to many different social movements, including the case for reparations that talks about how wealth was stolen from black communities and needs to be returned to not only us, but the descendants of those who were victims because of the lack of generational wealth in the black American community because of the government sabotage. Uh, it's also an important part of the decriminalization of black people. Um, and that connection is because so many police departments and criminal justice laws are put onto poor communities and oftentimes issues of poverty like, or crimes of poverty like robberies or delinquency are attributed to bad behavior or just something delinquent and wrong with black youth or black communities. But as we see, oftentimes, in, in majority of the time, a lot of these crimes are associated with people who live in poverty. If you can't afford to buy food, then one reaction might be to steal food. And a large reason why this poverty exists is because of laws like eminent domain that seized black wealth and left them with nothing, no matter how hard they work for it. I made so many other videos and I continue to make these videos. I have about 200, I reached my 200th post on Instagram a few weeks ago, um, and they include all types of small video or short video essays about current events. For example, I have one about how um, the black cops uh, who killed Tyree Nicholson 
we're, or Tyree Nichols, we're still operating under this larger system of white supremacy, and I explain how that works. I have one about the African American Studies ban, one on affirmative action that echoes some of the arguments that I shared from my op-ed. I have one about black mermaids, and the context behind that is the casting of Holly Bailey as Ariel, and people saying that it was blackwashing the character. I have one about the myths about black fathers, how most people say that black fathers are not involved in their children's lives, or they misuse data about children being born out of wedlock to say that black fathers are neglectful, and that's not true. The CDC found, actually, that out of all racial groups, black fathers who live with their children are the most involved in their kids' lives. And lastly, I have one about monkeypox and how racism was the cause of that outbreak last year. And to really hit home the connection that I had between the swaying of public opinion and the swaying of a political response, what you see right here is actually a, uh, a picture of a bunch of activist influencers who were invited to the White House by the president and the vice president to advocate on behalf of the causes that we talk about on social media. They saw a value in how we presented arguments and how we were the voice largely of our generation of Gen Z. And I could have made you play the bit of a Where's Waldo, but I circled myself actually. And you can see me in the corner right there with that big smile and the yellow circle around me. So to conclude, one important way of creating social change is by way of swaying public opinion. And a, the best way to sway public opinion is to add in historical context to make the argument in favor of what change you want to see in the world.